Right now. Welcome everybody. Tonight is a special night. Instead of live requests, I'm interviewing Neil DeGrade of the group Dirt Poor Robbins. Um, I checked out this band last week and I really loved them, so I reached out to Neil and he uh, got back to me and said, yeah, let's chat. So Neil, yeah, yeah. welcome to the channel. Well, you know, I heard those smooth pipes doing our uh, reaction video. Uh, yeah. was, uh, this guy, <laughs> this guy needs to be in broadcasting. I was like, I, if I had something for you to do a voiceover for a trailer, you get that kind of like, I don't know. Um, I forgot the guy's name. Who's the guy with the giant mustache? He's like a Marlboro man kind of guy. Oh. Um, he's got that kind of gravelly voice. I love it. Uh, I love it. So anyway, Dirt Boy yeah, Robbins. Okay. Yeah, Up exactly. next, Dirt Boy Robbins. <laughs> Perfect. Hell yeah. I'll do it, man. I keep hearing that, but nobody says, here, I got a job for you. You know, right. it'll happen. They'll just sample your voice for AI and not right. pay you. Fine. <laughs> That's how it's going to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, your music, let's see, it's different. Like a lot of stuff I listen to, it's hard to categorize, which I think is great. Um, and uh, first song I heard was Fever Dream. And I, I really loved it. I loved the sound of it, the production of it. And then the next one I heard was uh, Scarecrow, which oh, it's, a, yeah. it's a very different song, you know? Right. But uh, there's always that thread of you can tell who it is. The, when I listened to Fever Dream that day, my wife and I were driving to South Bend about a half hour away. I said, hey, I want, I want to put this band on. I think you'll like them. And as it went on, it was just something different, something different. And it was just really, really fun to listen to, man. I appreciate that. So what we've done over the years, we kind of uh, we'll, we'll kind of bend genre into different genres depending on the concept of the record. So our previous record to um, this record's called Firebird, and we're releasing it slowly to the public. Um, it's got a little bit of a throwback '80s vibe, like '80s prog um, kind of vibe to it. But it's still my wife. She does most of the singing in the Fever Dream is a song I do most of the singing on. Obviously, she comes in at the end and she does background vocals. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, so it's always us on top of it. It's us using our same kind of chord changes, our same kind of writing style. But, you know, for the previous project, Queen of the Night, it was a 1920 silent film we had put our own music to uh, that we made. And it's got more of a vaudevillian, uh, you know, everything wow. is, there's like, there's no synthesizers on it or, uh, you know, not a lot of shredding. Sorry for the guitar fans. But we'll just, uh, we'll just switch from record to record and... Yeah. One of the things we notice is the people that follow us, they're people that are fans of lots of type of mu types of music. Um, sure. So we they've given us permission to incorporate stuff. I'm sure that they prefer one thing over the other, um, like I do for bands that do this. But, you know, I was when I was little, I, I listened to Queen and the Beatles. And um, yeah. they had, you know, there's they, they always sounded like themselves, but it went all over the place. And I loved that, you know, for someone like me who had a short attention span who, who liked a lot of different things. <laughs> and there were other bands I liked, like Heart and ELO, um, that had a specific sound. But, I mean, great musicianship, incredible songwriting. So, uh, but we try to, we're trying to keep that tradition alive. We love these concept records I grew up on, and we're trying to keep that tradition alive. We're trying to keep some, you know, depth and richness to the lyrics and uh some philosophical content in there as well as musicianship so right. we're trying to do uh, it really it's like an homage to everything i like plus the fact that i'm also kind of bad at copying things so it ends up sounding like us all the time so <laughs> that's a good thing that's a good thing yeah, yeah. well uh, while we we're listening to it um even uh like while i listened to fever dream when you started singing i was kind of like wow because i wasn't expecting not just your voice but the phrasing and it yep. reminded me a lot of like uh well, you're singing your voice and your phrasing reminds me a little bit of Danny Elfman's compositions. Oh, like, I love know, Danny Elfman. I, yeah. I thought you might. <laughs> and, but your compositions are very, they're very theatrical. Very, uh, um, yeah. is that, you know, is that intentional? Like That's you totally that? fair. So okay. I started out on classical music when I was a kid and um, uh, playing piano, classical. Everybody in my family, like both sides of the family plays piano. And, uh, it was the song Let's Go Crazy. So my dad was a radio announcer, and he played the the song came on um, his station, Let's Go Crazy by Prince. I'd never heard it before. Yeah. And then at the end, Prince is just tearing it up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I'm like, what is this? I want to do that. I, that's what I want to do. Yeah. And um, so I instantly got interested in guitar, started listening to Van Halen, and 
I had no guitar players around me. Um, nobody, literally nobody played. And so I didn't know what was supposed to be hard on guitar. Like I didn't have other people who were like struggling with the instrument. So I just put on records. I put on Evan Halen. I put on Yngwie Malmsteen. And, uh, you know, I put on these kind of players and I just thought that that's what I was supposed to be able to play. This, so this I is just what you're it. supposed to do. Yeah. So I just played wow. it and it was like, oh, this is, you know, okay, that's guitar. And I had no idea until I went out into the world. Like, um, they, you know, so I was pretty young, but the first time I went to a studio, I think I was 13 and the engineer there like pulled me aside and he's like, I'm hiring you to play on my record. I'm like, wow. I'm 13. I'm getting a studio gig already. This is great. Um, I didn't know that I didn't know that it was like like better than average. Let's just say that okay, I didn't yeah. know that what I was doing was that good. And um, my family, again, everybody's musicians, everybody's in entertainment and they're all incredible. So um, I just didn't I didn't even know. So I, I really uh, it kind of started taking off from there, but I never believed I could do it full time. Um, wow. OK, so why, wait, why did I say that? You said the um, you're asking me a question about, about composition and uh, composition. kind of where, okay. where your inspiration comes from. Yeah. Okay. So what happened when I started getting into music is I realized that music, the, just pop music in general was heading in a direction that I wasn't like, I was yeah. seeing more richness in life, more pattern in life. I was seeing things deeper. Um, I didn't, I don't mind shaking my butt, but I didn't want to just shake my butt and I didn't want right. to lower I didn't want to go to the lowest common denominator because what happens is in a world with such short attention spans, everything gets like scandalous right away to get people's attention. And I was like, I don't, that's too easy. That's too easy. Yeah. Like I'm not like, I'm not offended by it, you know, but at the same time, I'm like, I, I want to do more. And so I noticed that, that in cinema and theater, normal people would go and appreciate all types of music and understand types of music that they never would put on at home. Yeah. Sometimes they don't even realize it, that they're in really yeah. enjoying this song from this movie that they wouldn't usually listen to. Yeah. Like Danny Elfman, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, like the score for Edward Scissorhands is one of the ones that came on my radar when I was younger. And I was like, gee, this is beautiful and it's haunting and I will listen to this and maybe okay, maybe this wouldn't come on the radio and be a hit, but maybe there's a way I can start to pull from cinema and I can yeah. pull from theatrical stuff where I can do something familiar that's more challenging to an audience and get away with it. The The first uh, film score I ever bought was, for the score, was for the, the 89 Batman that Danny oh, Elfman did. And mm -hmm. that's the first time I got really kind of struck by the score of a movie as opposed to like the soundtrack, you know? And yeah. the soundtrack was horrible for that. <laughs> there was oh, Prince, Prince is in a weird, a weird spot in that that Batman movie. I don't know why he was in there, but the, the Elfman <laughs> score dance. was a, yeah, the Elfman yeah. score was amazing. And he's doing he's touring now, doing like industrial almost metal stuff. You seen any of that? I heard some of his stuff. Like in uh, twenty twenty was the last time I engaged in any of his new stuff. Yeah, um, you know, Oingo Boingo was always cool for me. Um, again, he's. Uh, you know he's got he he's interesting because he doesn't repeat himself as much as people think he does. Like people think they can just kind of do an imitation of Danny Elfman. It's like no, there's something more sophisticated going on. At the same time, what gives someone a sound is that they have tendencies. You know, sure. so he has kind of he leans like into like the carnival uh, a little bit, and I love that. I love the carnival. Okay. I love the carnival imagery. I love carnival sounds. You know, there's something about it. It's like there's always like a haunted carnival somewhere in his music, and um. <laughs> You know, I think that he's also a, a, a bunch of things that he never does. So some people have made mistakes with him in the past. Like Ang Lee um, hired him to do the score for that first Hulk that came out with Eric Bana. Yeah, uh, yeah. It wasn't great. Uh, and Ang Lee kept telling him every time he would compose something, he's like, um, oh, that sounds like Danny Elfman. I don't want it to sound like Danny Elfman. <laughs> Why, and Danny why would Elfman you? Was, was, yeah, exactly. I know exactly what you're going to say. Like, why would you hire Danny Elfman right. if you don't want to sound like, why do you want, like, hey, all those things you're good at, don't do any of those. Do brand new things that you're not good at. Yeah, I think that's, that's a weird. mistake. Yeah. So uh, it didn't work out. Danny Elfman was agreeable to it, but I bet you he regrets that at this point in life. Yeah. So, wow. But the cinema, the cinema, we try to bring the cinema in. We got, like, we were just calling it cinematic rock when we first started. We don't have a good name for it. Um, and uh, because I wanted it to, yeah, have that richness and depth. Uh, you know, the problem is when you start to pull from these kind of kind of things. When you're making music now, especially for you know commercial purposes, and it has to go out and sit on YouTube next to other music. Yeah, is that 
stuff that's more open, that's you know a more electronic, or um, it doesn't have as much room sound to things and whatnot. It's um, very hard to compete with that because that will perform incredibly well in speakers. Oh and so yeah. I've had to figure out over the years how to get like a full orchestra and a rock band with lush vocals up at the same level they're mixing at. And I've got it, I think. Yeah. <laughs> you know, after all this time, but you don't you don't realize that um you don't realize that that why that's that you have to compete with those things, that there is a level to how much you can actually put into music. And I have to find all these tricks to make it perform in speakers like this other music that's just a drum and a, a synth and a vocal. Yeah, it's interesting because there's... Um, uh, we talk about that a lot on the other... <clears throat> on my podcast with the Gaijin guys is... Because there's uh, Alan on there, he, he mixes, he's a studio guy, and um, I do my own stuff, like, barely. And... Mm-hmm. You know, everything now, whatever it's being played through has automatic EQs and stuff on it. Like it used to be you would just, you'd turn a tone knob and then you hit EQs and now you don't even, you didn't even get to do that half the time. So yeah. how are you supposed to, how are you supposed to mix for that? And that's what you're, what you're trying to fight with, huh? Yeah. So, um, but I have, so I have an engineering yeah. background. So the first engineer who really took me under his wing, uh, was a guy named Craig Alvin and he's, uh, he's won Grammys. Uh, now, uh, but he was kind of a nobody when I was a nobody, but he was super generous with his information. Hmm. And he wasn't just like, you know, people talk numbers and they talk math with you in audio. He was like all mojo. Uh, nice. He was just throwing this dark magic at the speakers and <laughs> smashing things together in such a pleasant musical way. And I really, I really owe him, a, you know, a debt into the fact that I live in a world where I can produce, engineer, mix, you know, all of our own music. I make all of our own videos. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, you know, everything you heard on Fever Dream, I played. Um, that's pretty yeah. much what I do now because uh, it, it was it was a way of surviving because one of the things I wanted to do, I didn't really, we had a record deal at one point. I didn't like it. I didn't like not making money um, when we were selling records. When I had, when I was independent, we were doing great. And then as soon as I had a label, they were taking all the money. Yeah. Um, even though we didn't have a bad contract, it's just the way things work. They get this, you know, they start spending all this money on you and then you have to recoup it before you make anything. And it's like, I can't not make money. Um, so, uh, you know, so anyway, over the years, you know, the the level of success we have now would have bought us like a gold plated hot tub in the eighties and nineties, you know, where you would yeah. get millions of people listening to you. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, not anymore. So the way we combat that is I, do everything for nothing so i do everything myself um except for the mastering at the end i use either black lab mastering um or georgetown masters in nashville and i do everything except the um that so now you know i start to make money right away on the record and now i can make the music i want to make i can make it on my terms and that was a much better thing for me i never really wanted to be famous i just i had this picture in my head that one day i would grow up and I would have a studio in my house and I could make whatever I wanted to. And there was an audience to make it for my kids would come in and sit on my knee while I was playing guitar solo or something like that was the picture I had in my head. And yeah. then like, I've got that going. So I'm, I'm super psyched. That's I'm great. super psyched, you know, but yeah. <laughs> we're making the music. <clears throat> it might as well go farther. So, you know, uh, we've always, we always tell the people that follow us that uh, they're our marketing team since we don't have a label, like we don't market really. Um, we don't spend any money on marketing, so it's like uh, word of mouth. That's it. That's all we got. Yeah, it's it's really. I mean, we've seen the change over here for several years, several years now, and it's like, why? I mean, I know if if you're the right kind of music, yeah, a label might be good for you. But if you're doing anything outside the norm or just <laughs> like where you can't yeah. focus on one thing, you want to do a variety of things, and yeah, you got to do it yourself. It's 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 a it's a, it's more of a grind. Would I mean? I mean, you're you're happy where you're at. It seems like, like uh, oh you, yeah, thrilled. You mentioned um, fame wasn't really a thing you were striving for. No, uh, I mean I do get recognized once in a while going mm-hmm. around, but that's uh, I don't put myself in many videos. So unless they follow us on like Instagram, they never see my wife and I. Now my wife is something to see. I'm not. <laughs> um, so uh, <laughs> you know she's a uh, she's a looker, but I'm I'm this guy. I just got to go with trying to be interesting. Um, 
So the yeah, the, the fame was never a thing. I just wanted to make the music. <clears throat> so I got into music when I started recordings because I had things I wanted to hear. And uh, so it's like, well, you go make them and then you hear them and then you enjoy hearing them and then you show them right. to other people. And when they enjoy it, like now it's a different experience. It's uh, and so I don't I don't think I ever lost what happens to a lot of people is they lose their first love is that they start to do music and they realize they're pretty good and instantly they're trying to figure out how to make a hit. So, yeah. I mean, because that can that works once in a blue moon. It works that approach. But got to be uh, lucky. I was just hoping there were other people like me that meant if I could make something that I liked and moved me, that there might be other people like me out there. And if we could find them, then we could all like do this together. Yeah. I think, uh, what the, the state of music now and what it's shown me is that the artists that we, that we put up on a pedestal as a child who were just the, the few people that could make great music where it was, they were just lucky enough to get noticed and there are millions of people that are just that good, you know. There are some there are some writers that are just have something else, but there's so many people that are so talented, and that's what that's what I'm trying to do is just explore all these different people and kind of you get them in front of people that may not hear them otherwise, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. So no, many good, uh, so many good artists. There are there are a ton of people. You know what the thing is? So even though the technology is proliferated to the point where everybody has access to it. I don't know if it's better than it was when we were kids, right? So when we were kids, there were like three stations before, you know, I had cable and um, there were all the bands went through all the bands that we heard normally went through major records and went through mm -hmm. incredible engineers, incredible producers at high end studios. And just because these things became more um, consumer available, it yeah. didn't mean that there were more talented people in the world. You know, so I don't, I think that too, we also have like more good stuff than ever, but the same amount of great stuff that we've always had. Like there's always just a tiny bit of great stuff mm -hmm. and a lot of good stuff now. Um, and so for bands, I think it's very hard to stand out amongst um, just a bunch of good, really good things out there. Um, especially too, because like, like I can play on time. Like, I don't know if that means anything, but like now it means sure something. Does, yeah. it's Pro yeah. Tools. It's like I can go in and record something and I don't have to edit a thing. And there's some other guy who sounds just like me, but he's edited the crap out of it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's the other side of the world. So it's hard for people to really tell, um, you know, what makes you stand out. I remember when I was a little kid, I played soccer and I was really like one of the better players in my league. And I was sad because no one went to my school, played in the league. So no one knew like this was a way to like, you know, become popular or form your identity or get some credibility. It's like, hey, I'm a good soccer player. Well, one day they finally played in gym class and I was like, oh, here's my chance to show these people <laughs> at this new school that I'm awesome at soccer. Yeah. And when they dropped the ball, nobody played positions and nobody played soccer properly. It was just a shuffling mounds of kids kicking each other in the shins and the ball would pop out once in a while and there yeah. was no chance to showcase yourself. And so I think there's a lot of artists coming up. Like I talked to so many people, they're so good and they're like, they would just love to be in a spot. Like I think last month we had like you know, it gets bigger every month. We had like two and a half million streams hmm. and they're like, Hey, how do I do that? And I'm like, Oh gosh, like now, <laughs> like, <laughs> right. It's like, you know, so and people generally end up trying to hunt for something viral because they, the things that they find sometimes just went viral and yeah. they want to figure out how to do that. Um, I don't suggest that. I suggest you just make music you're proud of, make music that you want to listen to. Um, and you keep putting it out there and you keep going and uh, I interact with everybody. I love the people. I'm a people person. I love the people I talk to online. Um, we're just trying to make one fan at a time. And then eventually that turns out to like, yo, you look at the end of the year and you're like, oh, wow, we had, uh, you know, 1.1 million people listen to us. Different people. Yeah, listen great. To us year. It's right. Great, but it starts great. out with one person, starts out with 10. And then if you could become just a couple of people's favorite band, yeah. like they're, you're their favorite. Now you have something you can you can start putting some energy into. Sure, I I put out a little a little EP on my own like a couple, few years ago, and I get about twelve a month on listeners. <laughs> but I think the thing was, the only way I was able to communicate with people is through through my channel, which looks at a lot of Japanese hard rock and heavy metal, and my music mm -hmm. is not that at all. <laughs> so when they go to listen to oh, it, I noticed like, that about like, you. What? But you <laughs> Do you listen to stuff like the stuff that you play, or is that just the stuff that feels native to you? I don't really. That's just how music comes out of me. It's a weird thing. Right. 
but that's yeah um i i played i got my start playing in front of people at acoustic open mics i um, i didn't really play acoustic but i met a, i met a guy at a pawn shop he ran an open mic he's like you mm-hmm. need to come down to my acoustic open jam I'm like i don't play acoustic he's like come down and just play so i went mm-hmm. down and then i started writing kind of for that style and it stuck with me yeah okay that so, makes sense um so yeah that would, totally I, makes sense yeah, yeah we listen to stuff like that, but then I go, I sit down to write a song and it comes out. No, because it's so weird. Like if you, uh, you know, like there's this joke that it's like the, uh, you know, the painter's house is never painted. Or if you ever like, <laughs> if you go to Beverly Hills, and you're trying to find a good hairdresser, pick one that has really bad hair. Like they're always <laughs> the best. It's this weird thing. So if someone like pulled up my library of what I listen to, they'd be like, oh my gosh, this is, this guy's is weird. Like this is yeah. not going to be good music. He's, but I don't, I don't make the stuff I listen to. Um, and I make stuff that's different than anything I listen to. So um, well, I think, okay, go ahead. Uh, well, like what I was going to touch on, you know, that what you listen to is where your influences come from. And that doesn't, to you, do you think your influences show through in your music, even though it doesn't sound like your music? Or do you not consider? I don't know if I'm being influenced much anymore. Okay. I think that my influence happened. Um, again, I can, I can give you my bands. It was Pink Floyd, The Beatles queen primarily like my dad brought home this queen record to me from the radio station when i was five i can still hear still hear queen oh yeah no doubt for sure (laughs) no doubt um well they're kind of they're trying to i feel like we're aiming for something similar um a similar effect that is for the audience um and uh you know so um elo was a big band for me i loved elo um in the 80s my gosh i love the 80s um I, my brother li- bought everything, like every hard rock thing. He had Hit Parade magazine, Circus magazine, and I would have never bought any of these bands, but I would listen to all of them with them. And I had, I like, you know, Queensryche was one that stuck out to me. Yeah. Um, older you know, brother? Yeah, older brother. Okay. Um, Queensryche uh, stuck out to me um, and uh, some other bands like that. But I kind of like the neoclassical stuff myself. And then I'd be listening to Simon and Garfunkel. I'd be listening to like... Um, I don't know, just some like stuff that had nothing to do with anything I was playing. Um, and so, I mean, the, really now I kind of listen to classical. I listen to like chant, like, um, you know, Near Eastern uh, chant yeah. and choral stuff. Um, but I like Stravinsky. I like Chopin. I like really like Debussy. I like the Fr- all the French composers pretty much. Um, but then, you know, I still like Muse. They still they still hit some spots for me. I still like Radiohead. Yeah. Uh, there's some newer bands i think of in the pop realm um this was i don't know how but they found me is the name of the band great great band um but songwriting is kind of slowly dying a little bit for my taste someone who's trying to be really trying to add some poetry and some punch uh to what we're saying and doing i just feel like I'm, i feel less and less of a kindred spirit in the world out there at the same time there's this like growing audience this hunger hung uh, hungering for some kind of meaning in the music yeah. something besides this kind of plasticine plastic saccharine sweet sugary world out there that really doesn't have the substance at the bottom and they keep needing to eat 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 and consume and consume and consume um but there's no depth for their soul so uh i feel like that our, all of our people that follow us they're smart like i don't know why like they're like they all they're all people i would hang out with in real life and like we all have great conversations online or yeah board and stuff so um i'm i have hope i have hope that there's like an end in sight to this sort of uh some people call it the meaning crisis which is the fact that people don't they don't know what to believe in or what to pursue anymore and so they just pursue what's ever the loudest thing in front of them that seems the most attractive Hmm. and from what we know of like how life works it's just not a great idea like you're gonna (laughs) you can be led anywhere by the pied piper that way you know straight out of the city and so um yeah hopefully uh hopefully there's a growing um desire for that because we're st- we're seeing it on our end you know i i agree i uh when i started i made a discord and <clears throat> excuse me and once it started filling up with people and like you said all the people that follow you real smart so i have a lot of people in my discord are there's a lot of just engineers and, and scientists and all these really yep. smart people and they're all we all have like a huge desire to just 
find more music but we're you know we all have our things that we liked before what brought us most of the community together is a love of, of japanese music that we found and but then we find out that we all just love so much different music we make playlists of all these you know just I've, I've learned of so many different bands that are old bands and new bands and from all over the world and uh, it's just you know none none of us really listen to the radio yeah <laughs> just because, well, because yeah don't want to hear Who it. listens to the radio anymore right. i mean uh, you listen to when you've got your own personal jukebox that plays exactly what you want you don't have to wait through the bad songs and commercials yeah right. I, why um it's too bad but um yeah, yeah i love uh, i love that i love um it's funny because i don't listen to a ton of metal but every once in a while someone will introduce me to something uh you know it's like some portuguese ambient uh deathcore band yeah. and i'm like this is really smart. Like, I don't know if you guys understand what they're doing and how hard this is to pull off, but it's, right. it's pretty incredible. Um, and there's some people, uh, so was it, was it last Christmas? Uh, you know, Mark Tremonti. Yeah. Um, yeah. Alter bridge and well, the band Tremonti and I think he was in Creed. Yeah. Creed, right, Creed. yeah Creed is uh, and Creed bought him a house. That's pretty epic. Um, yeah. that's what happened there is <laughs> oh, pretty amazing, but we hung out in his studio and played his stuff and, what a what a like fantastic musician he is and you know people could sit on the outside and like you know you know poke shots at that you know like this yeah. kind of music or whatever yeah. but it's always easier to to uh, to uh see a rotten egg to smell a rotten egg than it is to lay a good one and the sure. dude is great and he just did this project where he was uh he did all these frank sinatra vocals he with the frank sinatra orchestra something oh, totally wow. different and he's just a maniac where he will practice something to the point where he can't miss it. Um, and that was so impressive, but I mean, I think, I think metal gets is still somehow, I don't know how this happened. It still gets kind of the short end of the stick. Um, because, okay, I'll give you an example. When I was in high school, like outside of like the real, like there are people that were just like, seem to be criminally inclined a little too much, Yeah. but there were people that got into metal and cause they had like, whatever, like dad wasn't available. They had issues and sure. something about, or they felt trapped like I did in like public school. And it was just torture cause it, nothing was moving fast enough and nothing was interesting. And you're just in a cell all day long. Yeah. And like the hard stuff really had a way of kind of helping me work that out. And everybody I grew up with that was like a metal head is like the most well-adjusted person I know. They're like, they worked out their emotional problems. They've come to terms with it. Now, I'm sure some of them, a certain percentage of people end up in prison because <laughs> they're aggressive. Uh, but right. it has this it has this therapeutic effect on an audience. Um, and I don't even know if people really know why they're attracted to it um, at the end of the day. But uh, I think that in Japan, it seems to have a different function. Like, what's been your experience with the metal culture, like, as you're starting to get into these Japanese bands? I've been curious. Well, um, the the main one that I got into is Bandmade, which is my shirt. Oh yeah, I watched a video you did. They're they don't even look. It doesn't even look real when aren't they're they, playing. Aren't they incredible? <laughs> I've seen them live several times, and it's it's just a, to to see them play what they do is amazing. So, um, and they they verge on metal occasionally, but it's just pretty it's pretty progressive rock. They do yeah. they do a lot of different stuff, and they do everything. Like I I, I like to say. Whatever it is they're playing, you think that's the only thing they do. That's how good they do it. And then the next thing, oh, maybe this is what they do. But they just they just do it all. So there's a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of metal with a lot of gutt guttural screaming and stuff, and mixed in with some clean vocals, which we have here. But uh, it's all it's all positive, you know. There's some definite um, some grind corey music that's just intent to it, its intent is to be shocking, you know. But for yeah. the most part, it's like here. I've I've tried to explain to people who mainly older relatives and stuff about heavy metal. They're like, oh, well, it's just mean and evil, blah, blah. I'm like, no, it's not. So the, the hardest metal I could show you that I have is nothing but how to move forward and be positive in your life. How to overcome struggle and come out stronger on the other end. That's what almost all of it was unless it's just some like slayer where they're just trying to be shocking to be shocking you know what i mean yeah that's a great point um uh because i noticed like in in you know american culture for example um so ronnie james dio yeah like one of my favorite singers of all time one of my favorites um rest in peace ronnie but um he if you listen to his lyrics he was a really good lyricist for hard rock and metal and uh all of his songs he was never the victim he was never whining it was all yeah. about like it was all like you, that you have agency and 
people mistake mistakenly listen to his stuff and we're like oh this is demonic look at this imagery look at this <laughs> stuff it's like no man like there are gargoyles on the top of notre dame catholic church in paris right for a reason because there is a way in which we drive back evil but becoming a bigger and better monster ourselves and you know i mean monster it might be the wrong word but i think it's a good word in the sense that it's like um we, that's what a soldier is like if you're going to be a good soldier you're a monster to the enemy sure. and so you grow up in this world and it feels like everything has agency over you and you're just a victim and ronnie james Dio got it he's like you guys are going to come with me we're not going to be victims right we're gonna we're gonna assert our will in the world yeah. and uh i think that's one of the beautiful parts of metal that uh people have mistaken um i think like bands like iron maiden they're like they're they're con they're concepts and their what they took on was like actually historically informative um and uh so i i think it gets a bad rap for that reason um you know even like bands that crossed over to the mainstream like twisted sister in the 80s that album stay hungry was huge it had yeah. you know we're not going to take it and we rock um yeah. was it yeah yeah um, i want to rock i want to rock that's right yeah. we rock it's a uh, deal i'm back on deal again um <laughs> so if you listen carefully to that record you realize you can take it either way every song you can take sure. that song to be like hey stay away from evil or you can take that song to be like you know i'm a monster yeah. And uh, if you listen closer to the record, that's like the really – Dee Snyder is a smart guy. That's the sweet spot for rock and hard rock and metal in America is when it's like it hasn't committed. It didn't, it didn't tell you what to be. It's just telling you can be – you know, you can be something then different than what they're telling you to be. Um, and I think that's cool. I think in Japan, like from my – from what I've noticed a little bit too, there's there seems to be a little more um, – they care a little more about proficiency um, first. Like the, it seems like the bands with the highest level of proficiency seem to win. Um, just musicality and uh, technique. I don't know. That's just maybe an outsider's perspective on it because I haven't experienced a ton of it. I would say they got the same kind of problem we have here, where the, the stuff that's really easy to listen to and doesn't take a lot of uh, involvement from the listener is really really popular. But then there's bands if you look for them. Like, uh, if you, you can pick any band and they have a phenomenal bass player, a phenomenal guitarist, a phenomenal drummer, and every, the amount of skill in these bands is just immense. And, um, I mean, I think you're right. They're not necessarily the most popular, but I don't, because the, the bands I, that are all over my channel, they're not they're not super popular in Japan. A lot of them are gaining more audience outside of Japan because hard, hard rock isn't that big there. And metal is definitely isn't that big. there. So they're still like in kind of here where it's maybe not underground, but it's definitely not mainstream, you know, but there's so yeah. many of them. Well, I noticed too, though, there's some people that were, they were heroes of mine from the eighties that have sustained a career overseas. I had no idea what was going on in, yeah. in Asian countries too. Like, you know, Paul Gilbert and Ingvam Malmsteen and Marty these, Friedman. Marty Freeman, for sure. Uh, these guys yeah. who could just absolutely rip. Um, you know, again, I, I parted ways from that style a little bit. If we want to talk about guitar playing for a little bit, oh, we want sure. to talk about, let's talk about guitar. Let's do it. All right, I'm all for it. I play, I play guitar. I play cello. Uh, I have a cello. I have it behind me. Like, nice. Cello is an awesome instrument, man. That's really uh, anybody who can play a fretless instrument. You got respect. <laughs> well, that's what your voice is already. So if you can sing, mm. uh, and you have, I guess to so. Yeah. That get in tune that's what your your voice is fretless um really yes. every instrument if you want to look at it is oh, my dog is trying to come in hey puppy <laughs> um so uh any um every instrument we have we don't really understand something as a usable instrument unless it's a sound we can replicate with our own voice um it's there's a weird there's a weird thing like okay so let's get back before we get into guitar technology in general mm -hmm. like so nobody ever invents technology or no one ever see it as useful if it doesn't if it is an extension of something you can already do for example like you can walk therefore yeah. a car is a good idea because now if i just this trade-off of this money and this you know maintenance i have to make on this vehicle look at how much farther i can go every day is this a fair trade-off right okay, so you, yeah 
you know so now if someone invented something that had nothing to do with human activity i couldn't even really conceptually give you this because it wouldn't it would never occur to us because we would never see it as useful it's like oh here's a thing that does this thing that humans don't do yeah. right so yeah, um, well this still applies to music right so um you know because like i have glasses this is technology people don't realize glasses are technology yeah like i can't see i've been blind most of my life without okay. them. <laughs> so uh they're they they allow me to do something better that i can already do it, it amplifies my vision yeah. um refines it so the guitar is a super interesting thing because you know there's in in instrument world as someone who plays like pretty much a little bit of everything um not really great on woodwinds i'll give that to someone else <laughs> um so is that you realize that it's like that the the sound it makes like so guitars <clears throat> It, when as we moved into the modern era, they're more of a they're an instrument that has the ability to sustain, but originally it's a rhythm instrument, meaning there's an attack and then it goes it starts to die. Sure. So when you, once you hear the note, it starts to dis, it goes away. It's an event in time that disappears over time. Wow. Um, you know, so like a uh, violin is the sound of fire because it's friction that makes the violin. So there's scraping instruments and there's instruments that like a cello. So you actually with with guitar pedals and like overdrive and amps we started to bring the fire into this rhythm instrument to make it more of a lead <laughs> I, instrument right i like that yeah well so you have to think about these things like because like there's a reason we we find certain things appealing and other things we don't so there's this weird misconception i mean, it's not that weird but the idea that like beauty is in the eye of the beholder or taste is in the eye of the beholder but there's a, in a sense that like it doesn't matter if your tastes are different in a genre there's still a symbolic function of those instruments within that genre that's the same as it is in the other genres. Like, meaning that it has a certain meaning to us, that music is revealing to us um, some different level, like some subtext, some implied thing that's happening in the world. Just like when you add a score to a film, it's telling you the emotional content that you can't mm. see, it's adding. It's telling you what's going on in the inside of the scene as opposed to what you're seeing you're seeing certain things and then it tells you what's going on in the inside yeah wow you tracking yeah okay i'm hanging in there okay so let me give you a real simple example to kind of break down everything i just said that might have been a little too like much into metaphysics I, or something well I, I get the the how it kind of help music can help you understand what's going on well it's something also, you may not understand it, it kind of reinforces what you're seeing yeah, okay, let me give you another example of how it works. Um, this is all going to help us talk about guitar in a second, I promise. Um, so you, we think we see with our eyes, yeah. right? Now you move your, like, don't move your head and see how much of your room you can see, yeah. right? Now if you turn your head, like you also see with your neck. You don't think of it this wow. way. Music is like a neck. Yeah. It, uh, so it will frame up different details based upon what you what you put over an image so there's this classic example it's this bee there's a bee in this video and it's flying and it lands on a petal a flower petal right and mm -hmm. it's uh it's in super super slow motion you can see the wings like whoa, 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 comes in okay so in example a they put like a tchaikovsky ballet over it and the bees flying in and you're looking at this bee and you're like this is beautiful like yeah, it's yeah. a what a what a cr incredible creature that like all this intricacy in this thing who knows how it got here and what it means but yeah. it's like look at this thing it's almost becomes a ballet to you when you're watching it now they replay the same scene and they put on terrifying music and now you start to you don't notice the beauty of the bee you notice its weird little mouth yeah. and its creepy hands right so music like the neck can turn you turn you into a different spot of the room and frame up totally different details very okay. interesting so this is guitar. So guitar has, um, I, I can tell you one, uh, uh, we'll talk about a different aspect of guitar quickly. The thing that was attractive to guitar for me was that I could take it to the edge of the stage, wrap all 10 toes around the edge of it and play it, right? Like I was playing piano and I was stuck and guitars were lame at the time. Like I'm all for guitars <laughs> these days, but at yeah. the at that time, it was like if you if you weren't wearing like some funny hat like Devo, the guitar just looks it was it just didn't work. Um, but with a guitar, I could get out from behind that piano and go right to the edge of the stage, and yeah. like have this conversation and assert myself over the audience. Right. Um, so that's one of the fun things about it is like 
you know, so it's mobile. Like, okay, let's put that aside. Um, but, you know, so guitar, like, have you ever thought about, like, why it kind of took over the 20th century as, like, the like the symbol of music and rock? Have you I, ever thought about this? I have wondered about that. Uh, because yeah. I, I even I've wondered that about, like, uh, why is it a snare and a kick drum? Like, there could be a different thing that took those places, but th- those remain. They will always remain. They're and so I think, great. They're hard to beat. Yeah, and I guess they're, you have to beat them, but they're hard to beat. Well, that's probably with with guitar to where there's variations of it, but what we've landed on is probably the least finicky of all the uh, variants of guitar, with the fretted, unfretted, or or lutes and and such like that, to where it's they're just they're awkward, they're shaped funny, and but I I don't know. No, I think you're right. I think I think what's beautiful about that is like if you think about the guitar, you know, it started out with less strings, it started out with different intonation, started out with different tuning. And over time, you know, it had a thing it could do. The guitar was always in the back seat, right? So what people don't realize is that the this symbiotic relationship with technology and music and venues, like all these things go together. So if you look at the twentieth century, technology is already a big factor in music like a violin is a piece of technology uh a, you know of course a brass instrument and a brass instrument for example i'll give you an example just so you, you can uh, people listening can start to wonder about what instruments mean like brass instruments come from the fact that they used to actually make horns out of horns of animals and horn is a dead thing it's like a dead part of the animal it has no feeling it's already died but you take your life and you blow it into it and the sound, like something resurrects, wow, yeah. right? Like it comes back to life. And so this is how they use brass in movies always. It's like, it's either about the mourning of a loss of life and like a gentle dirge, or it's a resurrection. Like if you look at like how those horns are used in the movie Inception, like, blah, yeah, blah, yeah. it's like something's happening. Like wow. there's, you know, something powerful is happening. So, um, so guitar is it just in the background. It's because you know what the problem with the guitar is? quiet well it was quiet yeah then then amplification i think i maybe i don't want to jump too far ahead i think i maybe know where you're going with this because of technology oh do it take it from me well because horns are loud violins as when you get a whole line of violins they're loud so guitar was always quiet so it was in the background playing playing rhythm and the banjo was like the was ahead of guitar because it was louder yeah yeah so you get amplification you get uh you get uh Oh, let me think of the, the right names. Who uh, Bigsby and uh, Les Paul? Yep. They figure out this. They figure out a way to get these thing amplified and keep them from feeding back all the time. And now all of a sudden, they can they can compete with all these instruments that have been around before them. That you're you're so you're, you nailed it. You and they can okay. they can cover the range. Whatever yep. you want to cover, they can do it. Oh, that's so good. Bingo. <laughs> uh, let's put some more flesh on those things. Okay, so the guitar comes around and then. Someone invents a microphone and speakers, right? Yeah. Now, what you if you ever listen to music in the 1920s, people are like, you know, I got this voice. And they're yeah. like, oh, my gosh, why did people think that sounded good? It's like, that was the only that way to get it out. Right. Right. Like, we don't even remember what people sang like before there was recorded music because they had to use whatever tone allowed them to carry the largest space. Like, we don't know. Like, oh, people yeah, did not sing right. like Frank Sinatra. They did not sing like Bing Crosby. They did no, not. No, that would have been too quiet. We didn't talk like this. You yeah. didn't address an audience like with these lower baritone voices like we have. That's a right. microphone. The microphone lets us shine. But the tenor is one in the past and the soprano is one in the past because they had the louder, reedier voices, right? Hmm. So uh, guitar, the same problem, but suddenly someone invented a microphone and an amplifier. And now you've got something different happening, right? Yeah. Um, so this instrument that was just for chamber music was for small settings. You know, it wasn't for guitar, wasn't for concert halls. Suddenly, Django Reinhardt six a microphone in front of that they you know these bands like if you listen to those Django Reinhardt recordings they're just off the charts incredible yeah and he's pushed forward closer to the microphone so like one of the things with the old mixing boards used to grab the fader and if you wanted louder you didn't push it away from you you pushed it towards you like you okay. were pulling it closer to the microphone huh. um, yeah so with uh, Django Reinhardt like so his ensemble they would he and Stefani Grappelli who played the jazz violin they would just move closer when it was time to take the lead. Yeah. Uh, and so, but now suddenly, okay, so you weren't playing uh, 
stadiums yet. Nobody was playing stadiums at the time. Um, you weren't playing stadiums, uh, but you were playing nightclubs, right? You were playing clubs. Mm-hmm. And so people don't realize there's this, <clears throat> like, okay, so let's get into guitar. So what guitar really drives a lot of the genre changes of the 20th century in the sense that, um, okay, let's take, uh, you know, churches. So it's like pipe organ and choir. It's like that was the venue. There was there was a sound. There was a technology, pipe organ technology, yeah. right? Um, and then there was a way to participate. You go and participate a certain way. Like so, in a church, it could be from reverence all the way up into like a gospel, you know, maybe a black gospel church where um, it's very participatory. It's not reverent, like in the sense of sitting back in reverence. Your reverence comes out as exuberance or enthusiasm, and so um, there. There was always like a way to dress, a way to behave, and a technology that went along with the new genre. And then also you got to think about the venue. So jazz turned the speakeasies and clubs into a venue. Um, yeah. You know, the Beatles turned your headphones into a venue. Oh right? yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't think about that, but like suddenly stereo recording. So like, be- they they record with the with the intention of being listened to through headphones as opposed to being listened to out out on stage. Yeah, but they could also now, you know, amplification came to the point where they could play a baseball arena. Right? That's yeah. just something new. Um, so, I mean, it didn't sound great back then, I imagine. They're still kind of, you know, the way they would do it back then is they had a couple of microphones in the front of the stage that people stepped up and sang into, and the band just blasted loud enough that it hit those microphones too. <laughs> and um, I still practice that way with the band. We practice... Um, I practice without everything mic'd except for the vocals and the band. Everybody gained stages, so it we don't, don't we learn not to overpower the vocals. Oh, that's cool. Everybody, so when you hit your boost pedal, it's not an arbitrary level that's going up. It's the actual right level to go up to sit. You, so you're mixing yourself. So the sound guy doesn't have to be like a magician. Yeah. Back there, you know, <laughs> like we treat him like he's just like supposed to know what our music's supposed to sound like. It's like no, we tell him what our music's supposed to sound like. If we did it right, he doesn't touch anything exactly um, yeah yeah so um you know if you look at the beatles they did they took the headphones they made it into arena. led zeppelin turned the stadium into an uh a venue right. and there was a way to dress there was a way to behave at a led zeppelin concert that was different prior there was a different way to behave at a at a uh, grateful dead concert um sure. even hip-hop hip-hop kind of turned the car into a venue turned cruising into a venue turned a low rider into a venue yeah certain way to dress there's a certain way to behave there was a certain <laughs> type of technology that came out with that uh, we had the same thing in Electronica. Um, the problem we're running into now is that we've kind of hit... We, we're starting to, like, max the capacity of things out. Because people don't understand that, like, we think the sky's the limit. Like, technology can go forever, but it has a point where it stops. I'll give you an example for uh, just a scientific reality of sound. Sound has a maximum volume it can be before it, before it stops being sound. It's, like, around 150 decibels. It's, like, a little louder than a jet where it stops being sound and now it just actually starts pushing matter out of its way. Okay. Right? It doesn't become, doesn't become sound anymore. So what, what you're talking about with the guitar is the guitar actually, like if you think about the difference between Eddie Van Halen and me, you know, there's 50 years has gone by since he first plugged into like one of those Marshalls and, you know, came up with his brown sound. Yeah. Hadn't changed much. Hasn't changed much. Yeah, true. There's not really guys that can play circles around Eddie Van Halen anymore. Now, not really. You know, pull different things into the mix they've they've mixed things but guitar in a way kind of hit you know it's kind of hit a point where it's almost perfect like the cockroach where it's uh you know there's certain (laughs) things like a cockroach or a horseshoe crab that just haven't evolved in however long yeah Um, you know so uh okay that's that's the history of the guitar i think and as far as why i think it took dominance in the 20th century was because the technology allowed it to it was mobile it was expressive it um it wasn't stuck like a piano but it could you could voice multiple chords um someone who very simply could just learn a few chords could sing and sound good like a guitar is just as hard to master as anything yeah it can be simple it can be incredibly complex it can suit many rich people poor people uh, and like you said with the piano, you're literally you're anchored to wherever that thing is, unless you got a, a portable keyboard or whatever. But a guitar is just easier to move around, so more people encounter it, more people get familiar with the sound of it. They want to play it. 
And it's cheap. Like you talked about Les Paul. Like he invented like his first guitar. He had this idea about the solid body and he invented a yeah. guitar called Log. Yeah, like the railroad tie. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And that's a cheap guitar up there. That's not. Oh, that's one of the simplest things you can get a Telecaster. The bolt on. And yeah. uh, it's an expensive one because it's a Sur and it sounds better than other Telecasters. But, um, you know, it's still like it's it's stupid. Like I could build it probably and I'm not even good at building things. It's um so there was something like you kind of met this point where it was like, okay, the simplicity of the form was designed, the the options were maximalized for guitar. Like what a guitar can do versus what it could do eighty years ago is massively different. It's I could still do the same things we did eighty years ago with a guitar. Yeah, yeah. But we can do way more. Like I make my guitar sound like a synth, I can make it sound like whatever yeah. I want. Um I can play drums on it now if I want. Um, <laughs> you know, so uh that was uh that's the guitar. Um that's uh, like uh, your short college lecture. Um your <laughs> academic thoughts on the guitar. So, now well, go ahead. Okay. I was you mentioned a, a limit to to music and what you can do with guitar. So, I mean, do you think we're at a point where there's pretty much everything's been done? You just got to find a way to make it interesting in your own way. I mean, how much farther the things people do now with guitar are just mind blowing to where even, even Eddie would see some, some people today and be like, what, <laughs> you know? Oh, I know. And, I know? And so how, how much more complicated can it get? You know? Well, I, you know, I don't know if what we want is complicated either. Oh, I agree. And I can, you know, so on this record, I've cut loose a little more because we're throwing back to a little bit more of my 80s influences uh, because that fits the sound. But generally, it's got to be a composition for me to work as a solo. Mm, like if okay. it does, if I can't sing something back and it's not memorable, it doesn't have a landscape to it, doesn't have a picture it drew. You know, if it's just a bunch of random techniques that are in impressive. Yeah. Um, like I'm never, ever, I'm never pressing record and thinking about how do I impress people right now? Like I never sure. do it. Um, I know that you can and make good music. I just, that's not what I do. Uh, I'm not criticizing that, that technique. Um, so, uh, yeah, so let's get back around. So like we have this, like this, this technology, of the guitar, but the guitar means something to us. Like it, um, okay. There's something, there's something more than just a person playing an instrument when someone plays a guitar, like a guitar, like points you in a specific direction. Um, I guess a good example of this is like, you know, we get back to technology, like a horse. A horse feels like, like I guess a guitar and a horse are similar. Um, a horse can do amazing things on its own, but a horse doesn't have a brain like we do, right? Sure. And, but we can't run like a horse. We can't jump like a horse. We can't go like a horse. But there's synergy when you bring up the human intelligence and you put it on top of a horse. Like we become the head for the horse. Yeah. And, now, what a horse and a person can do together is something very different that becomes yes. way more interesting to us than just a horse or just a person, sure. right? And its own thing. So there's something about guitar. Um, I, I think about guitar because I play, you know, I play a lot of things. But there's something about guitar where it's um, it really becomes more than just a person with a guitar if you can flow with it, like if you can connect with it. Um, you have those moments where it's like you're not worried about the technique and it's a song you can command and it's there's just something where it's no longer separate from you. You know, like you, yeah. you ever do a thing where you're like you have to reach for something farther than you can, like say like it's in a dark space and there's a button you have to press and you have a screwdriver. Yeah. Like you can actually use that screwdriver like it's your finger. Like you can feel it, right? Or it's like when yeah. something bumps into your car when you're driving your car, it's like it hit you. Sure. And yeah, and there's something really like mystical about um, connecting with an instrument because um, I remember when I first started playing guitar, I was like, it was just, it was so clunky. I heard this Prince song and I was like, I had this court. It was a court, which is like, you know, it was a knockoff Rickenbacker. It was like mm -hmm. the least cool guitar at the time for what I wanted, but it's what <laughs> we could afford. And, you know, I, ha I was just plugging it straight into a PA. I didn't have any pedals. I didn't have any idea how anybody made distortion. And I was like, what the heck? Like, this is not what I was signed up for. Yeah. This thing is awful. And I knew like <laughs> one A minor pentatonic scale in one position. <laughs> That's all I could do is play like three riffs. Yeah. And I drove my parents crazy. And then eventually I could afford an amp that had like a little distortion. And I had this like yeah. Dawn American metal that, pedal. And when, I, when you get the amp, you're like, this is what I. <laughs> 
this is what I needed the whole time. I've been trying to figure out how to make that sound. <laughs> it, it like did this thing where it was like you hit that chord and it was just like you just you heard the harmonics in the chord. And you yeah. just wanted to keep hitting those chords. And it was like power chords suddenly made sense. I was like, sure. why was some my guitar teacher teaching me these power chords? They sounded so bad on my guitar through the instrument. And now yeah. there was like, oh, my gosh, it was amazing. Um, but then, you know, over time, you start to like figure out how to make it talk and sing. And yeah. do something and say something. And I mean, we take this for granted. Like, where does this come from? Like, you know, like we lose that kind of all wonder we had when we were kids when there could have been like a, I don't know, like in, you know, like the Chronicles of Narnia, like your grandmother's wardrobe could have led to a secret world. Like, you didn't know. You didn't know right. what was it's, out there. It's funny. My son's learning. He's been really working at guitar. So I'm seeing him go through all those stages I went through. So I've been playing for 35, whatever years. And I'm seeing him, and he he knows. I mean, obviously he knows I can play, but he doesn't come to me. He like goes and he figures stuff out and he works on. It. He's like, "Hey, Dad, look!" And part of me's like, "That's cool," and part of me's like, "You're not doing that right." But I I, <laughs> I like let him show me and let him enjoy <laughs> right. it. And sometimes I'll show him like, "Hey, if you do this, you know, you can really kind of get to the next thing." And he's like, "Oh, okay." But it's you're talking about how uh, how is it can be like your screwdriver was a part of you when you needed to be, and you're. I see him with his guitar and he's standing in his room, like bumping into things and stuff. He's just, he's not there yet. You know what I mean? If I put a guitar on, yeah. I know exactly where it is. I can walk through the house <laughs> and oh, be right. fine yeah. and yeah, he'll, no, he'll be know, bumping I, into stuff, you know? <laughs> I annoy people because I can pretty much, I get to the point where I could like kind of sing anything and play at the same time Yeah, and just hold a conversation while I play. Cause it's like uh, a second thing. It's like a, you know, it's like you have a fourth arm you can use. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's, but that's a nice crossover, though. Like the moment, like where you start to go from this thing that you know could be special, and then it starts to, it, it opens up something about the. I don't know. It like it's like, it's not even a representation. It's like a presentation that there's more to life than you can see. Um, music does this. Like it's like it's kept me. You know, my beard. I went gray early, but like my gray beard. Um, the, I I feel like I'm getting younger every day when I play music. Like it yeah. doesn't it doesn't make sense. It's like there's a door opening up back into that like childhood thing that the the world can be more than just like bills and jobs and <laughs> right. uh, you know stupid little pleasures and yeah. and things like that. That there's actually some meaning and there's a bigger story going on. And and a music might be one of our last encounters with that in this sort of dead flat modern world of. Um, where we just kind of we have this incredible power at our hands and the power is so strong and so salient that we can't see that there's like a bigger reason for life and story and music can still kind of like crack in like you did a thing in your video like you were getting chills on your arm yeah and yeah. stuff like that man like that's my thing like if if i'm working on something and at some point i don't get a lump in my throat i don't i don't release it have you uh know? Uh, here's here back here's a mundane question all this stuff but have you ever uh, written okay. a song and just been not happy with it like oh yeah all the time, like yeah. oh my this is horrible and but you 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 but you ever kept a song like that though is it just immediately it's gone or not on my own projects no they're on other people's projects where you're on a deadline right ah, so okay. I for other people i stopped working for other people a few years ago um but i would get hired to write or record or it's like i get this deadline on a film and i've got to get a Oof. score out yeah. And and the director loves something you don't, and you it's like, hey, he's the boss, okay. and I um I forget I ever wrote it and I never listened to it. Yeah. It's fine, <laughs> it's fine, and I and I collected a paycheck, and that really I was hoping it would be more than that, but at the very end of the day, you get paid, um, you know, because I'm really hoping every time I do something, I want it to be the best thing ever. I, I don't know if that's like no, I think that's something people don't understand. Is anytime. Yeah. You write a you write anything. You want it to be the best song you've ever heard or ever written. That's the idea, right? Why are you? I don't want to write it. Hill, here's a here's an okay song. I'm going to put everything I can into it. <laughs> so if you, yeah, exactly. So if you have fledgling songwriters and musicians out there, I can give them some advice about this. So I think t things taste better in a slow cooker. Um, that uh, so a lot of people get worried about forgetting a good idea. I don't worry about that. If it's a good idea, I'm not going to forget it. That's my theory. So one, if I write something, so uh, generally what I release to the public has been going on around for a long time. Sometimes, every once in a while, I'll just spit something out and it, I was so excited about it, I'll release it. But most yeah. of the time, I'll be working an idea and I'll 
I'll put it away. So I don't work on something to the point where I'm stuck. I never do stuckness. I think okay. stuckness is a bad thing. Um, so if you work on the point and you're stuck and you're trying, you're like spending three times the amount of time trying to find this next part, trying put it away. To, trying Go to make away. something work. Walk away. Yeah, you're going to That'll kill a song. You could have a great first half and then just end up hating it because you, you don't feel that second half yet. Yeah, yeah. So you just put it away and you and you pull it back <clears> out and one day like there'll be a, there'll be an answer to it. So there's a way to like engage things too cuz sometimes you get stuck because we're not listening to what we did and we're thinking about what we want to do instead of having a conversation with it and like being like, "Well, what is it what is it asking for?" Yeah. As opposed to here's what I want to do. There's a song like this and I want to do that. It's like it's not asking for that. Okay, but um, so one of the things I'd say to people is, you know, cause we've all done this thing where we're like, we're it's late at night. We stayed up a little too late. Maybe you had a little bourbon or something. I don't know. Maybe you're not a drinker. Um, but you're writing a song. And you're like, man, I am onto it. And like you record it in your phone or you record it somewhere and you're like, oh, I can't wait to start working on the song. And then you get up the next day and you're like, this is absolute garbage. Like what, <laughs> what kind of crack was I on last yeah. night? What was I thinking? Right. And so, cause we get swept up in a moment we get swept up in things and, so if you're patient and like you're just like okay like if you don't if you're not in a situation where you're on a deadline and you can just like let it go and then let it find its way back to you it'll knock on the door and like then you start to work on it again right that's how yeah. i do it um and so i have like 50 songs going all the time oh wow i've you know i've had i published probably 400 songs like with different artists and you know maybe 100 with my own band um now um so yeah, but I mean, it 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 you start to learn if you don't if you don't force it if you if you pay really close attention to, to like the reason you got into music in the first place. Um, so there's multiple reasons I got into music. One was like because it was awesome to hear it, and like it did something to you, and you're like you're yeah. like a wizard. You wanted to wield, work. You wanted to wield that magic too. Right. You wanted to be able to cast that spell and everybody have a good time. Uh, and that's powerful, and that means a lot to you, and you know it's going to mean to other people, and it's going to connect you to other people in a big way. And yeah. so that's what really got me into it, right? So, but there's other things that's like, well, it was kind of like it was kind of nice to have the identity of being a good musician, like that. I don't care about it anymore. But like when I was like, you know, 16, and oh, like, yeah. like chicks thought you were cool with your band, it was like, hey, all right, this is something. This is like give me a little more clout in the world, right? Yeah. So there's lots of reasons you can get into music, but um, I mean, so I mean, the, it's hard to say, it's hard to discuss this part of it because, you know, worldview comes into it. Like, why does music exist? Why, like, do you believe the world was arbitrarily, randomly created and music happened to emerge as like some kind of way to trick ourselves into being, um, to thriving? Or is music part of a bigger story? like part of the bigger story of why the world was made and is it have a function in that and so i i i fall in the latter camp i fall in the the camp where i don't see the world as an arbitrary place i don't um i don't think that anybody i meet is random or like just some product of science and biology i think that they are meant to be here um and so that really changes my view of music and people um so i think with music, I'm always trying to tap into to the to like the bigger story, like what pulls us all together, what um, you know, what draws us in, and I think that's important for people. Like, I, I I think it's a lot easier to be creative if you don't see music just as a power you wield, but as something that brings us together, like in a participatory way. Um, that's part of like this you know story of what it means to be human, um, and that it's meaningful. Well, I think that's way cooler. Yeah, you you got me. You got my mind thinking. It's like, well, music most certainly was around before technology. Of course, it was around before people. Birds sing songs now. They you got one hundred percent sang songs before we were alive, and we undoubtedly heard those songs or created some melody by accident, just trying to communicate with another hominid, <laughs> biped, whatever you want to call it, and yeah. So yeah, before anything else we're familiar with, and I'm looking in this room, there was there would have been music there before all that. Just so that, it's uh, a weird thing to think about. Like I never thought about that before. Like it predates everything. Yeah. No. Well, it, in it, it means something too to like, um, in nature, and there's a rhythm to nature, and there's a reason that even a parrot will start to bop if you put on a beat. Like there's a yeah. way that the rhythm is connected to your body, and there's a way that melody is connected to your ears and your mind um, in harmony. Um, mm. There's a reason, like, 
there's a reason we find disharmony or you know tension and release interesting because it's part of our it's okay let me let me talk about something different this will help you understand this um so you know there are stable things let's just say mythology or fairy tales there are stable characters within those genres there's stable characters within the horror there's you know werewolves vampires yeah uh, you know golems or mad scientists and these kind of things like frankenstein um and in uh in mythology you have dragons and elves and dwarves and you know fairies and these things and these aren't just because ancient people thought they look cool they were taking a pattern in the world let's say a dragon let's just uh no let's go let's go vampire that's more fun um sure. vampire okay so you're in the world <laughs> you're right you're in the world and you're looking around and you see uh there's a aristocrat in your town right who is his job is kind of like he, he has a lot of authority over you and he controls the the policing body and he gets to make the laws or he's participating in enforcing the laws somehow and it, when it goes well this aristocrat is someone of good reputation a noble person who brings a nice identity to our town like we live in this person's town and this is great okay look at all the wonderful things we get to do look at how orderly things are look at how things are flourishing what a great thing we we also know that positions of authority like we call them positions of power but technically in metaphysics it's authority um um it's like we see these people and they see you as something to suck the life out of and the resources from. The internet does this to you all the time. It's the algorithms designed to keep your attention yeah. and take your money. Like that's what it's designed. For. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that it's 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 a web. And it's not a web that like you get to crawl around on. You're the bug trapped in the web. You're stuck. Oh okay. wow. All right. So um, that's just how it works. And you can engage it, you can engage it skillfully. If you know what you're getting into, it's not like you have to avoid it. I'm not like anti-technology, um, but okay. So the vampire, okay. There, there's a thing about vampire. You can let's just think of any really bad politician, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're they see you as a means to gain power. So instead of helping you, they use you like in a slave-like relationship. They enthrall you and force you to do their bidding, um, and they don't come out in sunlight. Why? Because you can see what they're really like. Oh, why can't they see themselves in a mirror? because they refuse to look at their consequences of their own actions. They, they, they are narcissistic, they're Machiavellian, and they refuse to analyze themselves and the consequence of their actions. So when someone creates a character of a vampire, there's a reason it becomes stable. It becomes yeah. stable because it's a it's, real it's familiar. scary pattern in the world. Okay, so um, that's, that's called a condensation. So this is why fairy tales have this kind of like drunk quality, because like when you drink alcohol or wine or something like that, it's time compressed right into something and you take in a lot of time something that happens over time into you quickly and it has this kind of drunkenness feeling to it and that's why fairy tales kind of are like weird and uh or mythology can be weird but it's actually really it's compressing like a larger pattern in the world into a place you can look at and point at and be like that guy's like a vampire that guy's like a werewolf so like a werewolf is someone who's driven by their appetites they're not driven by they're like the de-domestication of man where we took dogs and we made them more yeah. like us and now they live in our house it's a werewolf's the opposite it's taking a person and making them like a dog right they're just going to be driven by their hunger um and they're not going to have a moral code so these things have meaning so also stories so stories do something very different stories do the actual pattern of an entire story is a decompression of life so for example like you walk into okay you're listening to my band right yeah you're trying to figure out what to name it you start to collect patterns and details, right? You're like, okay, well, there's a driving guitar here. Uh, you get kind of, well, there's kind of classical piano, but then there's this rock chorus. So, like, you're trying, you're having trouble naming it, right? I kind of like that space. Sure, yeah. Uh, but if you go to a restaurant and someone tells you to meet them at a restaurant, you go into the restaurant and you're like, I don't know what kind of restaurant this is. The name didn't give it away. And you walk in and you start to see like spaghetti marinara on a table and you see, uh, you know, like a Tuscan villa painted on the wall and stuff. <laughs> right, you're like, oh, yeah. an Italian restaurant. You decompress it, but you do it very quickly. You do it very quickly. Just like when you looked at this thing behind me, once you realized its scale, you're like, oh, that's a cello or a double bass maybe. It's really right. far away. Yeah. But you, you decompressed it. So stories do this. So like, for example, um, Wizard of Oz, like Dorothy starts out, she's at home and she hates home. I don't like home. Like home sucks. Yeah. Right? She didn't say that, but she should have. Um, she's like, home sucks. All <laughs> yeah. the goodness is out in the world. She goes out in the world and realizes comes back with a new appreciation for home there's no place like home that's right. what you do all the time like this when you look at something 
you don't realize it. So stories are presenting how your own mind works, and that's why they're so entertaining for us. They're breaking it. They're slowing things down that happen at too fast of a tempo for us to even notice how they're happening. And they're speeding things up, like with the characters that happen too slowly in life, right? Are you tracking? Yeah. Like, you yeah. Here? Okay. Oh, yeah. It's pretty... So I, this is how tangential I am. This all has to do with the birds. So someone told me at one point, it was really interesting. They're like, you know, the birds, like everything we see is a physical example of the unseen world behind it. Meaning that there's a smaller, lower version of a thing we get to see and experience so that we can continue that pattern forward into the unseen. You know, so uh, for example, um, Okay, so birds fly around in the heavens. Like people used to call the skies the heavens in the old days. This is why we say heaven. Oh, people go to heaven or God is in heaven. People yeah. say that, um, right? So like part of this mythological pattern is this idea that like the birds are a lower presentation of angels. These things that are unseen that sing, right? That are out there. And the whole idea, the way we used to see the world is something like, oh, well, let's just imagine like if you could remember back to being like a in the womb, like floating around in this like ambiotic fluid and you hear vague muffled noises that aren't articulate. You mm -hmm. might hear your parents' voice. You don't know what it is. You see light, but you don't see specific shapes. It's yeah. very ambiguous, right? So, but then you come into the world and then you see the things as they really are. But what if this world, what if this world is like another womb and there's even more detailed version? This is how ancient people used to think. They'd see the birds and they think, well, there's some cosmic beings that actually sing with actual words and music and the birds are like a stand-in for that and so i think whether people know it or not whether they're like a complete atheist or um you know or whatever they go to church or they you know they go to a synagogue or uh, you know a mosque whether mm -hmm. they do any of these things they don't they don't realize that the actual way we engage music like the fact that like your hair could stand up on your arms that's yeah. uh that's that's like a that's a terror response in a way like we're we're seeing we're we're the veils being lifted and we're suddenly encountering something beyond ourselves. That's what that's when I think music kicks ass, honestly. Like when music does that for me and I'm like, oh man, this this world is only part of what is really here and what's really out there and what we're really participating in. And I don't know if people know it or not, but I think that's my theory on why people like can't get away from music because it's constantly presenting something bigger than themselves and something bigger than we can even see. Wow. Didn't know you were going to go there tonight, did you? No, I didn't know that, but I'm glad we did. That's cool, man. You got me thinking about all sorts of stuff. <clears throat> but that, that's, that, I, that's, a, it's, it's super interesting because when, because you can hear, it could just be notes and I'll, I'll get that effect, you know, with make your hair stand on it and they give you chills and you just just the way yeah. something is presented to you and why why would it do that you know but yeah so weird just, we just we just accept it though yeah, it? We, yeah. Like you, you grow <laughs> you're up right. and you're just like i know what a tree is like you don't know what the hell a tree is no i'm sorry you know where a tree is maybe you can point to it and name yep. it properly but you really like do you really know what a tree is and so man like hopefully like that's my side project um when I'm doing all this, so like the people engage our community, engage our records. So um, we had a couple of weird things that happened because I, I get into like pattern recognition, meaning that um, like if you, if for example, if you get enough information about something, you kind of know what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just like I could start to tell a story and you kind of know where it's going and I can hand it over to you. And then you perfectly say exactly where I was going to go. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in 2019, I was just thinking about the world and I was like, there's a problem coming, right? So I wrote a story to explain the problem I had in my mind. It was this album called Dead Horse we did. And in the album Dead Horse, um, and I promise I'm not going to get political with this because I'm not a political person. So, um, but in 2019, I was like, I'm going to write the story and there's going to be pandemics in the story and the pandemics are going to be used to give way to AI in and to you know so where people stop stop communicating in person right yeah, yeah and then the world has to figure out how to solve the problem with the fact that what people really want most is real relationships and now they don't have them so they're going to use ai to bridge that gap so that's the story of dead horse um so 2019 
I started releasing this record just like normal. I had written a song, uh, a bunch of songs about this kind of thing. You know, literally talking about people being trapped in their homes. And uh, there's a song called It Tore Your Heart Out that's pretty pretty explicitly about it, um, the things. But it was like literally March 2020 came around. And I was like, oh, our album is exactly for this moment. Wow. Right? Yeah. Right. So. So I start working on the next record like right away in my head, but um, we finish that one up. We release it. We tell people the story about it. People are kind of freaked out that, um, you know, there's, there's two songs that really, I mean, every song, there's like even a song about like election fraud and stuff, but it's not, <laughs> um, it, it's before it all happens. Wow. So, um, so it's, it's pretty specific, but then, um, we did, um, I think there's a way of seeing where you can actually like you don't have to be like totally mystical to kind of see what's coming. Um, and so we wrote that our next record was Queen of the Night. I decided to do something totally different. I noticed that I noticed that Hollywood has been kind of collapsing for a long time on, yeah. in on itself. It's been as I'm moving away from <laughs> politics or any interest in politics and more interest in people and uh, the world itself. I noticed that as like Hollywood is just like everybody's driving to politics like every movie has got to like declare its side it's like so stupid um so i'm like i'm gonna take advantage of this i'm actually gonna make a movie on a budget um i'm gonna make a silent film so i can put all our music to it and i wrote a story and the story was about this technocrat um who starts to get into space travel um takes out the largest loan in the history of the world (laughs) and buys a web of control right and so it was very strange because like the movie came out and then like Elon Musk bought Twitter and bought like, <laughs> you know, and uh, literally took out the largest loan in the history of the world. You can watch the movie. It's called Queen of the Night. It's on our YouTube channel. Um, but this uh, is a silent, silent film. Silent film only I do the music for it. Yeah. Uh, it's just, just music. music. Just music. And yeah, okay. exactly. And like the little slates come up when people speak. Like it's literally okay. a throwback. Wow. It's total throwback. Um it's it's just under an hour long so i i really uh i kept it true as i could i used very little cg cgi um uh most of it's like green screen and then we drew backgrounds and stuff um but okay. I, i'm pretty proud of the way it looks it's got it's going to headline the saint augustine film festival um in january nice. so um yeah so anyway uh it was just weird because like it was like here we are again like we got like this weird thing going on um because i mean people however you feel about elon musk or not like i um I think he's super interesting. Yeah, uh, do certainly. I trust him? Certainly. No. No. <laughs> exactly. And it is. I don't know what he wants to do. Bad he things wants- can be interesting too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's why I do like vampires too. Um, so, uh, you know, he wants to put chips in my brain and control me. Um, I don't know if he's a good guy. So, anyway, the story, like these kind of things, happen. And so, our new, our latest record, I'm afraid of because uh, yeah. Like, so I was gonna say, wait, what's right? what's the concept of your current work? Because we're gonna have to prepare. Okay, so I kind of already <laughs> AI is a part of the story again because it's just part of the future, and like you have to integrate that. I've started actually messing more with and in much the frustration of people like ai art and some ai film generation stuff yeah i use it in that video for fever, fever dream right so um but i don't do this thing where you just kind of arbitrarily type stuff into it and let it rip other people off i i train it on my stuff or have other artists train it on their stuff and use it so it's original um right. but anyway there's something so dis- there's something off about ai art and it's cool it's super cool i don't know yeah, why i thought your video was great no, oh, thanks. Like the old, like these old drum machines and these weird pieces of technology that came up over the years. People still use them because they're not right, but they're cool, right? So yeah. uh, there's something off and phony about it, but it's also kind of it's working. So um, anyway, in the story, it, it was like this world in the near future. We're, we're going back to this dead horse universe, and we're telling another part of the story. Um, the one where the pandemics and the AI took over. It's like right after this fall of AI, where it collapsed. It collapsed in on everything, and so. Now there's so there's two like there's two opposing forces in the world that always exist and they're growing and one is like this um, like I mean if you ever read the book of Revelation it's super scary um, but there's this there's this weaponized version of like the totalitarian which is like the beast which is the like I want to control everything you do and I want to name everything you do and I don't want you to do anything that I don't know. Right. That's like we yeah. can see that. Like that's like the worst version of government. It's like yeah. you don't get to have privacy. Sorry. Because it's too dangerous. We don't like your autonomy. Right. There's this other side of the world where people want to reduce you to your things 
like your appetites like food sex drugs like they want to like remove they want to tell you keep you in despair so they can sell you euphoria to get you out of it and it's a terrible right. plan um it destroys you i mean we know this like if you're if you're a person in despair and you turn to drugs and alcohol it removes the effect of that for just a short period of time and then it like leaves you worse off than you found yourself yeah. beforehand fast food uh, right exactly same idea <laughs> this is the problem this is the problem with like you know just like the idea that the 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 populace is always right is that mcdonald's is winning um it's like 90 <laughs> trillion served or whatever yeah, yeah it's like is that really the best restaurant we've ever invented don't know no the numbers are saying it is so i don't trust the numbers um <laughs> so anyway the um so at the end of the day like in my story i noticed that there's so there's this category called materialism now people when they hear the word materialism if they're not into philosophy they hear the idea that you're really into stuff like a materialistic person really loves stuff. Materialism right. is this idea that that's all there is, is matter, and that everything emerged from matter, meaning that there was no, like, there was no originator, there was no creator, there was, you know, it's just that everything came about through these natural causes, and mm -hmm. which, of course, is, from my um, perspective, not very scientific, because no one has ever made something out of nothing. So there's got to be something else going on besides what science can account for. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, so materialism... The materialism lacks like this the world as we've kind of like thrown out like the devil and angels and fairies and centaurs and we throw those things we're like ah that's silly uh, yeah. but they look cool we'll put them in movies um, as we've <laughs> yeah. thrown out these like patterns that kind of like really were good at communicating like something spiritual um they left the world kind of flat and left people kind of empty so um i think the thing we see coming right now is like psychedelics the people like materialists like the idea that psychedelics could fill that void. In other words, it's a technologically controllable way to have a spiritual experience. Um, I don't think this is a good plan personally, but in my story, we're living in a world where they do. Where so basically, the this totalitarian spirit has gained control of the water and all the sources that you need in life to survive. And it every time, let's just say, imagine this. Let's imagine a, a president. It's not a president in the story, but like someone like a president that every time they presented themselves to you. At home, they microdosed you, yeah. So that they were like God to you, right? Okay. So that you didn't—they didn't have to force you to comply. You couldn't wait for them to tell you what to do because <laughs> now you got the thing you wanted. So that's the pattern in my story. It's this—it's uh, this psychic, like this constant drugging of the populace, so that they. Um, some people call this a um, a pink police state. Like, you know, they talk about the police state where they, like, want to monitor everything. You, they, yeah, you're going to yeah. out your neighbors if they're not wearing a mask or something like that. That's like a police state. The pink police state is like, no, we're going to give you something awesome. And so you're going to do what we said. Right. So that's the kind of the concept of the story Firebird. But in the story of Firebird, there's because um, I believe at the end of the day, there are weird things in us. OK, so let me give you an example. Um, you can go to a zoo and you can look at an animal in the zoo and in that zoo they've given this animal everything this animal could ever want yeah. right they've given it companionship they've given it food it's free from danger guess what happens if they don't put walls on that enclosure it and runs away from it all yeah that's right and that's what people are <clears throat> and so we've got this mistake and this weird exchange with our government and our system that we think that if they give them what we want we want we're going to be happy but no it's not what makes us happy right it's just not it's like in Jurassic Park where they put the goat out for the T-Rex and they're like, yeah. all right, you go. Like T-Rex wants to hunt. And I think <laughs> right, hunt, yeah. you know, so, um, wow. So this is, yeah. So this is, this is part of the story, um, we're dealing with. So we're not, I mean, really, I bet this is why I think our band does fit prog rock because prog rock, if you look at bands like Rush and you look at bands like Pink Floyd, like that, but Pink Floyd's a good example because they're not necessarily shredding. Like, you know, like some people think, sure. yes, yeah, prog rock but prog rock isn't just high level musicianship prog rock is like no they give you something to sink your teeth into intellectually philosophically and then even lower psychology uh, psychologically so um you know i think that's that's the kind of stuff that keeps my attention i know there's people out there that can't find enough of that if you can't find it like check us out maybe because <laughs> maybe we're doing something that uh, yeah you know, so do you let me ask you for for a concept album like this do you sit down and do you hash out like the overall story the arc of it do you outline it or do you as you're going along you kind of figure out what's what 
So, um, well, let me give you the the most clear example would be the silent film we make. Is when you make a when you make a film. So when I make a record, I don't have to tell anybody except for my wife Kate, who works on it with me. She writes yeah. with me. Uh, she's incredible. Um, she's this weird savant in the sense that she kind of taught me how to write lyrics. I never cared about lyrics. She taught me how to write lyrics. Now I think it's our thing. Like lyrics, oh, okay. are one of our things. Okay. Um, so, uh, and she's also like one of these weird people, like. You know, when you're learning music and you're like trying to figure out how to play in five four time and it makes sense, she can just do it. She, no oh, one has okay. a teacher. She just does it. Like you give her these weird intervals. Like I know this is a weird interval. She's like, "What do you mean it's weird? Tell me to sing it." And she sings it. It's like, "Okay, fine. You're okay." The rest L- of us lucky you. <laughs> the rest of us have to practice, Kate, but you can just do it. Okay, yeah. fine. Because um, I've worked with much like more trained musicians who cannot even come close to picking up things as fast as she can. Wow. Um, okay, but anyway, so Queen of the Night. I have to. Because I'm making a film, I have to get other people involved, right? So I have sure. to write a script. So I write the script. So I take, I took what's normally just in my head, and I put it on paper. It took me two days to write the script. Um, I talked to this guy named Jonathan Peugeot, who's uh, probably the best guy in the world with symbolism. Like, you know, like the kind of symbolism I'm talking about, like with the birds and, you know, all these things. And so the story, okay. the story has to do with the moon, like the moon, and like the spirit behind the moon. Um, you know, one of the things people don't, ever pay attention to in, in the modern world is that uh, what are the chances that we have two giant circles in the sky that are the exact same size from our perspective? What are the chances? Super small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty Super strange. small. What are the chances that one, the moon has a 28 and a half, 29 day cycle identical to a woman? And scientists have no idea how it's identical. Like, what's, what, it's, presenting, it's presenting something about the difference between a uh, uh, feminine and masculine in the universe itself. It's like in the moon. So I was kind of musing on this idea when I made the story and I made my wife, this uh, queen of the night, the spirit of the moon. Uh, she looked pretty dope in the role. Um, so anyway, I had to write it down. Um, I plotted out. I normally just do bullet points. So when I'm doing a regular record, I know the story in my head. I do bullet points and then I look for the points of the story where I need a song. Mm-hmm. So in like if you ever watch a musical, you maybe never thought about this, but um, a lot of musicals do songs that are exposition, which means they just describe what's going on so you know the plot. Sure. There are other songs in musicals where they've gotten to a point and they stop in that moment and they celebrate that moment. Let's imagine like the first time these two lovers come together and they sing a song. Okay. It's not forwarding the plot, but we're celebrating and, and fleshing out that moment, right? Yeah. So you have those two ways you can do things. A song could be expository. Or the song can kind of be, um, you know, a celebration of a moment in the story. I I do very little expository songs, like which okay. just describe and forward the plot line. So there's a record we did called The Raven Locks. It's actually written as a musical that we cover ourselves. So it's a musical that I made that we just decided to cover. So we don't play the characters. We just record the songs as if we were recording the songs ourselves. Um, there are a handful of songs that are exposition, where it's just describing what's happening, what's going on but very few so it's sometimes it can be hard to follow the plot line if you just listen to the music and you don't know the story yeah. but i like that so when i listen to the wall when i listen sergeant peppers is barely a concept record but like when i listen to the wall when i listen to dark side of the moon when i listen to okay computer by radiohead mm-hmm. when i listen to operation mind crime by queensrike i didn't totally know what was going on but you could tell it was going somewhere and i like bathing in sort of that like making up my own reason why. And so that's kind of what we're doing with our audience is that we want you to be able to tell there's something coherent going on and we want you to use your own imagination to come up with something that's really satisfying to you. Um, Because people want to want to know what I think. But at the end of the day, I feel like there's like a sense of where it's like, um, I have no business. um, I have, you know, it's none of my business what my song is about. (laughs) <laughs> or my story it's like really because there's a there's a pure way it comes across like what i like i said before like almost like in a prophetic way if i don't think about it and i just feel my way towards it it seems to be truer than if i try to write a story so <laughs> i don't know how else to go about it um but yeah we do i do write it out i tell kate the story she needs to know the story and then a small group of people after the fact like I'll post something somewhere for people who won't leave me alone and want to know what I think it means. <laughs> yeah. And I'll, I'll tell them the story. So wow. if you follow us, you get in our discord, you can, uh, um, I think our Discord's public now. Uh, you can, you can, you'll get story bits if you want it. I have to join up too. Yeah. I didn't realize you had Come one. on in. I'll, I'll be, yeah. Hell yeah. 
So join. where are you on Discord? I want to I want to check out your Discord. It's a uh, mere cord. I'll send you a link. Okay, great. Oh, is it private? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. But yeah, I'll get you a link. You can come on in, and I'm sure people because there's a there's channels on there for just for about everything. There's something <clears throat> deep thoughts, which is basically just memes. <laughs> there's other channels where actually people discuss things, you know. So yeah, it'll be fun. For sure, very cool. Um. So, I mean, that's you got anything else you need from me tonight? I mean, I had a bunch of other just kind of normal questions, but I think we covered a lot cooler stuff than what I was going to ask. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm a weird interview. That's okay. Uh, no, it was a great interview, man. That that went places I wasn't uh, didn't see it going, and that's fine. Well, I mean, if there's anything like you can leave people with, because you never know, like, you know, you get an interview, it's like, yeah, like, what am I supposed to do in an interview? Sell people my music? Like, sure, that'll come up. But at the same time, it's like, Hopefully you give people something that they can go and then next time they they fire up a song, it means something more to them and they oh, start yeah. thinking about it. Like hopefully like I I watch like Rick Rubin and a couple other people talk and uh, David Bowie's one who does it for me. It's like I hear music differently after I listen to them talk about music. Yeah. That's what I have the list of questions, but those are there if the conversation doesn't go anywhere. Oh, <laughs> I can ask you, you about you really... I can ask you about previous bands or you know that bullshit. But this is way more interesting. Well, do you have one on there you really <laughs> want to know before I go? Uh, let me see. Let me look through here. Because I gotta. The, gotta the ones I care about is how you how you go about creating the songs and music and that stuff. I really want to know. So you, we went over that. You probably touched on the surface of how you do that, but like, um, if you can say like, if you have an idea for a song, what's your what's your first step? I mean, do you grab a guitar? Do you grab whatever's around, or you hum, sing something into your phone? Oh, this will be really annoying. I can do everything in my head now. Yeah, I can write orchestral compositions in my head. Yeah, so I don't need to pick up anything anymore. Sadly, sadly, I mean, sadly because it's not helpful to other people to tell them that. Right, it's just not. No, but it's that's like, a, that's that's a new way. Yeah, I don't need a guitar you know. tuner anymore either. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I just, <laughs> bum 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 bum. There, this oh, the notes are always there. So I have a keyboard in my head, and I have the instruments in my head, and nice. I can write and compose. But I will. There's something. It's not enough to do it that way, though. I will pick up something eventually. I'll hear the parts, and then when I play it, I'll know. You know, sure. I don't really know until I actually sit down and play it, but I can write in my head. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of, I kind of do the same. I get the whole, get the idea. Cause I do, if I need keys and something, I can add keys. I can learn a part and play it. I can't sit down and play piano, but I can play yeah. keyboard parts. I can simple enough beat. I can play or, you know, bass, or whatever. But sometimes what you think just doesn't, it's not what it needs, but sometimes it's perfect, you know? No, it has to it has to exist. It has to become incarnate in the real universe before you really know. Uh, but it's it's a huge advantage because like I'll be on a you know eight hour flight in a couple of days here, and I'll write a song on it. You know, in my <laughs> yeah. head, and I, then yeah, memorize the parts. So I wrote a song in an MRI one time. <laughs> it was it to the clicking. Well, I I don't know why it happened. I had a, I had a, a chord progression in my head for years. I had the same. It was something I just played when I picked up a guitar. Yeah. And I was in there, and I just thought about this character from uh, Peaky Blinders, actually. Okay. And And then it just, I was I was in there for like, I'm going to be in here for a half hour, and it just I just started thinking. I'm like, oh my God, I'm writing a song. I'm like, I can't write anything down. <laughs> so you better I just, get I just kept going repeated, over repeated. it and going over yeah. it and going over yep. it, and I got out, and I'm like, I just wrote a song, and the woman's like, what? <laughs> like, I don't know, but I have to go. The first. I gotta go. Oh, so that's I can, so cool. So I can well, write this it, stuff down. Yeah, writing it off a character too. That's a great idea. Like I, I do that sometimes in my head when I get stuck in a song. Is that if there's a character in the song, I ask the character what they want to say. Yeah, it's a weird drill. Oh, and cool. then you find that sometimes you get an answer that surprises you, like you didn't think of it. And you're like, what the hell's going on? Right <laughs> Who um, am I talking to? <laughs> but that's so cool. Yeah. So people can start to do that. So people generally, a lot of people can write grooves easier than like holding and audiating tones in their head. Um, that's fine. Like, I mean, music is so rhythmic now um, mm. compared to what it used to be anyway that really it, the rhythm makes or breaks the song in a lot of situations. I'm still a melody guy. Um, and I hope that, uh, I hope, <laughs> I feel bad because sometimes I show some like, I'm like, oh, this is a really good melody. And I show it to my kids. And they're like, that sounds old. <laughs> and they don't mean old like what just went out of style. They mean old like it sounds like it's from the 1930s. And I'm kind of like, good, I'm on to something. It doesn't but, mean uh, bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Exactly. That's cool, man. So, anyway, 
Uh, dude, this is great. Thanks for having me on. I like. No, it's it. great having uh, you, man. Thanks um, for letting me just rip on whatever the heck I was into talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Makes my job easier. Dude, it's awesome. <laughs> you definitely uh, got you got me and whoever's watching thinking about a lot of things they weren't going to think about tonight. And I thank you for that, sir. Hey, you got it, man. All right. So Twitch Ryan Mir. Okay, I'm going to share this out to my peeps again and uh, share out your channel. Uh, what do you got coming up next on your channel? Uh, Thursdays I do my Patreon requests and that's where I learn about a whole bunch of music. Awesome. And you're Very still, cool. you're, that's a great, you're like cheating, like with Patreon, like you get people to find music for you. That's amazing. It's, it's <laughs> I don't great, mean cheating in a negative way. I mean like, but that's really like, if you think about it, what's going on, it's like you get, you attract people that have similar taste to you and then they find music and you share music with them and they share music with you. That's awesome. Yeah. I put it, then I put it out there and you know, and some of it is really popular stuff. Some of it gets a few hundred views in a couple of days, but that's views that that band wouldn't have got. And I'm happy about it. You know, that's, Hey, I really appreciate what you did for us. And anytime you want to do a, a video for us, I'm in, I will come and comment and share it. So All right, man. Uh, you're the man. I can send you some stuff. If you want some guitar driven stuff, I can, I've got some stuff in our catalog. I can point you towards. Sure. We do have a list uh, that people compiled and then I put it on YouTube of their, and this is outdated because I've done a lot of solos since then, but it's like their top 10, 11 solos by Drapore Robbins. So I got that on my YouTube oh, too. Cool. All right. So, all right, man. Well, good chatting with you and uh, hello to chat. I'm sorry. I didn't, uh, yeah, I'm... <laughs> I didn't even know there was a chat. Hey, look at that. I can see it now. Jennifer, a oh, Jennifer. Oh, sorry. Jennifer is in there. Yeah. She's the, the, uh, she's the chatty one. I like that. All right. Uh, Twitch is a cool thing. Um, I like what you're doing here, man. Keep it going. I'm rooting for you. Thanks, Neil. It was great talking to you, man. Thank if you me. haven't checked out Derpo Robbins yet, go check him out. Uh, they got a lot of great music, and you can tell from what he was saying here, it's something you're going to enjoy listening to.